All right, good morning. Thank you guys for being here. Um, always, it's nice to see everyone. I hope everyone's staying warm. It's really cold out there. I was all complaining in December it wasn't cold, and now I'm complaining that it's cold because <laughs> it's January. But it is a new year. It's a new year, new semester, new teachers, new class, and we're all going to dive into this theme. Keith Smith was supposed to teach uh, earlier in January, but it got canceled for weather, and then Nathan Taylor was supposed to take over, and then they brought the third string in, so hopefully, hopefully it's all right. A lot of this is Keith's material, so blame him if it's not very good. It's his fault. But our theme for this year is transformation, this idea of transformation. And in this semester, we're going to focus on a transformed heart. We're going to look at the necessities, the hindrances, even the tactics that strengthen our heart. Sam and AJ gave a great class, I believe November and December, about you know, how we should, how we should, uh, you know, wow, I already forgot it. That's horrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> how we should finish strong. How we should finish strong. And it goes perfectly on what we'll be talking about this morning when we're talking about transformation. Because we can't finish strong if we're not first transformed. They did a great job of showing that. We can't even be successful in our journey toward heaven if we haven't been transformed. Because our old self, before we're transformed, spiritually transformed, it can't make it. It can't make it. And so we're going to continue. We're going to look at different topics, different characters and situations that show a transformed, a transformed heart throughout the months here. I also want to mention that this class is discussion-based, so I depend on you guys to have a conversation, to continue the conversation, to dive deeper into God's Word, because we all have different points of views and perspectives, and it's important. And also, as we go through the class, maybe there's something that jumps out at you that you want to kind of dive into that pertains to our theme and our topic. Don't be afraid to let me know, and I'll try to, we'll try to incorporate it into our classes and dive deeper into those. And we'll be paying attention, too, as well, to your guys' comments and, and what you all are saying so that we can, we can enjoy God's Word together. Because nothing's better than studying God's Word together. So let's dive in here. Let's think of transformation. When we think of transformation, we look, we observe nature, we, we observe ourselves and our lives and those around us. We've all read The Hungry Caterpillar. We watch Bug Life, right? Transformation, the caterpillar comes, it transforms into this beautiful butterfly, right? Does that mean it only happens once? That we're spiritually transformed only once? You think for a snake for a second, they, they transform, they shed their skin four to 12 times a year. That's a lot of transformations there. How does this happen? We look at the Bible, we look at Acts 2.38. We're baptized. That's a moment of transformation. And so we have to look at that and consider that. I want to hear from you guys as well. Wow, I pulled a Nate too. I need to get my clicker. I want to hear from you guys. What does transformation look like? What does it look like? Examples in your life and other people's life. And, and does it happen only once or does it happen over and over and over again? I want to know from you guys. No, you don't. You don't. That's a good point. They don't. They continue. They continue being that butterfly. What do you guys think? Go ahead. Yeah. Right. 
it's a continual transformation and growth. You're right. We look back. We have to examine ourselves and our past. Go ahead. That's a really good point. It is. And we're looking at that too. It is this continual growth. And as we grow, we get better and better. You think of a computer, every time you restart a computer, at least a PC, it's updating its software, right? It should get better. It should get better. What else? Yeah, AJ. Yeah, and if we're not careful, that, that could be really detrimental to our, our progress and our eternal future as well. We don't want to regress. We want to continue growing. Any ideas? David pointed out Romans 12. Let's open our Bibles to Romans 12. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. This is going to be our main passage throughout the theme, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He's absolutely right. I'm going to have a... Sorry. Yeah, if you could read Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove that the will, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler's going to be my reader for this morning. But as we go through this class, my hope is that it will give us a better understanding of how we can change our heart from you know, that of serving the world and what we read in this text from serving God's will. That's my prayer. It's, I think, our prayer as well that it makes us more effective in doing our jobs, our jobs as Christians, connecting with one another, sharing the gospel in the community. And when we read Romans 12, 1 and 2, what we see here in these verses is this shift. It's this shift in thinking and this transformation from, again, serving the world, and now we've changed our focus, we've renewed our mind, and we're serving after the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, to get our minds going, our blood flowing here. What are some other reasons, other than what we read here in Romans 12, that we might want to see or be transformed spiritually? There's other reasons as well we didn't catch on. But now we've kind of sat here for a second. What are some other additional reasons? Think of some? Yeah, spiritual worship is a big one, right? That's, that's a huge part of our life. When we're acting as Christians out there in the world, that's a part of our spiritual worship. What else? Yeah. daily process. Lamentations 3. Every morning we want to strive to be better than what we were before. That's a really good point. You've heard it said before that you want to be 1% better than you were yesterday. A lot of self-help people say that. Go ahead, Jamie. So, uh, Jesus 
just said that he came to have life. He can have life but Yeah. And many people in the religious world take that you know, I can live, but we know that the world is passing away with us tires. Uh, that's not what Jesus was talking about. Mm. He came to show us what life Right. And that how we I love that. Spiritual transformation help us live the best life we can. And joy comes along with that. I think sometimes the world wants to try to feed us a negative message. I think it's not joyful at all, but it absolutely is. I love that. Go ahead, Tyler. That's right. That's right. We're going to transform into something, and, and we have to transform just as Christ did. Okay. No. <laughs> I like that. Being representatives, no matter where you are, comfortable, uncomfortable, we need to represent Jesus. That's a, that's a really good, really good point. Let's turn to Second Peter here. Second Peter. Second Peter. There's a lot of things in Second Peter chapter 1 shows some extra, some additional points of why we should be transformed. We should grow in the knowledge, have you know, meaningful relationships with our brothers and sisters, deep relationships. There is a reason why we, get, we become transformed and it appeals to us. And we shouldn't think we're living a transformed life if we haven't seen those effects. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to have Tyler read that for me. Verses 5 through 8. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect. So to add to a lot of your guys' points here, what this is showing, we read these virtues, and it's as, as if they are transforming and, and transforming and adding and adding and adding something new. It's continual growth, like you were saying. It's almost like these building blocks to continue building as we grow and we grow in Christ. And finally, it ends with there in verse 7 with this idea of love with love. And notice what is important here in the text when it comes to being transformed. It's that verse 8, that these qualities are increasing. We want to see an increase when we're transformed. Not to regress, or not to plateau, not to just stay the same, but to continue increasing in these qualities and in our life. And this is a complete life of really continual transformation as they increase and they make us more effective to do God's will and to follow what is good and perfect and acceptable. We read that way back in Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
And this is all just completes our, our journey here. This touches on what Sam and AJ were talking about in December. As they're talking about finishing strong, we get a picture of this. Look at verses 10 through 11. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 10 through 11 here. Therefore, brothers, by all the more, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So look at that word practice. We need to be practicing these qualities. We're told we are, what if we practice these qualities? We will never fall, never fail. That's a big deal. That's a big promise. But we can't, we can't finish strong if we don't practice these qualities. We have to practice them so that we do finish strong. And we, verse 11, we enter Enter the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's another point here, kind of add to, right off, who should we be transforming into, or like, or transforming our identity to? It, it, should, be, it should be Christ. It's his kingdom we're entering into there in verse 11. And we're not transforming into what this world says. We're transforming what Christ did and the example he set for us. And so we're going to look at this more here, but our goal is to dive deeper in these next months in the second Peter as well, and we look at the journey of transformation. Go ahead, Justin. Right. All right, that's the beauty of transformation, that we get to share in that glory and that divine, that divine power. It's an amazing thing. We're transforming into that. Absolutely. Was there another hand I saw? Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Ownership. Do we take ownership of what we do and, and control? Because there is a sense of responsibility that we have. It's a growing. We have a sense of responsibility as well. And as we grasp the nature of being disciples, of making disciples, discerning the will of God, what we saw in Romans 12, what is good and acceptable and perfect, we need to grasp first you know, the way God's people work and, and the way God works. Look at verse 3. I know Justin pointed out verse 4, but look at verse 3 of Second Peter. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things and pertain to life and godliness to the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. We can't fully grasp how these things work until we have the knowledge of him who called us into his glory and excellence. It just capitalizes there on Justin's point. It's so important that we strive and, and we see what we're heading towards. And a great way to actually look at this is actually the Sermon on the Mount. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus here. It's a great starting place to see more of this transformation that Jesus was talking about. So Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 through 7 here. And Jesus is introducing this, this new covenant and how it's going to be. And if we think about the new covenant... Coming from the Old Covenant, I mean, this is a big transformation. 
And it, it would be a big deal, a big leap for the Jewish people at that time to see this. And they're listening to Jesus' words, and they're intently listening, and they're seeing how big of, this, of a transformation this is going to be. I want you to think on that. You have your Bibles open there to Matthew 5. Think of some of those things that he points out. What do you suppose were the biggest things the Jews had to accept in their minds and practice during this transformation? In your opinion, what was the hardest thing? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. That's right, that's right. That's right, had to come from the heart. Right, right. Starts inside, that's right. You got to transform, I love that, from the inside out. And when we're transforming the inside, our behavior is going to follow. We're going to look at that exactly, exactly. What else? What else? Right. That's a big part. Sacrifice is a big one too, right? Inclusion to the Gentiles, that's a big one too. Really good point. Yeah. A routine. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. You've got to look at why you're doing the sacrifice to begin with. If you're just doing it just to do it, then there's no meaning or purpose behind it. And we'll, we'll see that as well. We'll also notice there's not as many specific rules or commands or all the rules that they added on top of more rules and more rules that the Pharisees had a habit of doing. And it's all of a sudden what you guys are saying, it's focusing, it's shifting our focus on what is more important. Because transformation, as we'll see, and as we've experienced in our own life, is not always going to be easy. And these Jewish people, as Wes pointed out, they grew up with these customs. It's a part of their DNA. And now we read in the New Testament, it becomes less about these customs so much, and it becomes more about Jesus, about more about him. And now we have to understand that Jesus isn't just pulling this old covenant out from its roots and getting rid of it. He's, he's fulfilling it here. Tyler, go ahead and read Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18, if you have your Bibles in Matthew 5. Do not think Sorry. Okay. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Perfect. What we're constantly seeing in this transformation is the shift. A shift if we're going to become disciples to follow Jesus. There will be a shift that trusts God and defines what's more important. Under the old covenant, the Jews were wrapped up in rules, the legality of everyday life. And as I mentioned just a second ago, they would add more rules on top of more rules just for the sake of adding them on there. And they had good reason to do this. They had meaning. They had good intention. We have good intentions about a lot of things. That doesn't mean it can always result in good things. What do you think was the, some scholars out there? What was the old law uh, for? What was the old law designed to do for the Jewish people? Do you guys know? What was the old law designed to do? I don't have that slide up there. But think about the old law. What was the old law designed to do? Yeah. Yeah, it did. It showed them that they can't do it on their own. They do need help. They do need God. He's the one that gave them the law to begin with, the old covenant. Good point. What else? Yeah. Yeah.
That's right. That's right. No nation is fruitful without any laws, right? It even says that God held their hands out of Egypt. Good point. Yeah. The law defines yeah. Said, but not to. But yeah. Those things you're not supposed to do, now you're and do. That's right. That's right. It was very specific. It said this is sin, oftentimes, and it's telling us not to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, it did. Right, right. There was an identity in those laws because it was rooted in, in God. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I like that. I like the idea of a spiritual there. We don't put emphasis on spiritual. And if we're just going through the motions, acting on this physical law, we're not thinking about the spiritual aspect that those laws have. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. Right. It didn't Paul even say that, that the law was good and helping me understand that as well? Yeah, it keeps us accountable there. That's a point. Yes, Kathy. Perfect. I, it was great. It did. It showed his atonement that he loves us, and uh, he loved his people. That's why he wanted to see them succeed. He wanted to see them succeed right, right outside of Egypt, of Egypt and into their promised land, and he set in those guidelines. Yes, David. Right. Yeah. It's it, it was a lot. It was a lot of work. Let's No. No, not in a sense. Let's turn to Psalm one hundred to kind of touch on that point. Oh, sorry, Psalm fifty one. Psalm fifty one. Because Jesus is now saying because this law is there to help transform them. He'll transform their hearts, and Jesus is now saying, be transformed, and be transformed in me as we enter into this new covenant. But by that time, of course, the Pharisees are abusing this as we've, we've looked at. There's a couple things here that are more important. Because even the old law will stress and tell us and show us, hey, what is more important? It's sometimes even more than sacrifice, he's saying. In Psalm 51, David writes this after he sins with Bathsheba. And we're going to jump through the verses here very quickly. So follow along with me. But starting with verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God. 
according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, right? We see that repentance there, that I've sinned and I need God's mercy. I depend on his mercy, verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Not only have we sinned against other people, but we've sinned against God, recognizing that's very important to our spirituality, so that you may be justified, it says, for your words and blameless of your judgment. Verse 6, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart where we'd be transformed spiritually, right? In our hearts, transform our hearts. Verse 10, and there it is, the repentance create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a transformation, a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit to guide us in transformation. Verse 12, restore in me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Verse 16 and 17, For you will not delight, God will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. I thought that's what he was pleased with, right? Well, verse 17, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. What is our heart behind the things that we do? The sacrifice that God truly cares about is your transformation, the recognizing, yes, you sinned, and you want to be renewed and transformed. He wants to see that shift in you. And if there's no shift in that, then, then we have to examine ourselves and realize that well, we haven't been transformed. So if we think back on the Sermon on the Mount for a second, Matthew 5, why do you think we practice what Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount? Why do we practice those things? Yeah, it is. You go right there. Yeah. It goes right to human, the human heart and the human nature. This is, this is what I want to see in your life come out. What else? We see purity there. If you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery where? In your heart. Right? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Pray humbly. Yes, Josh. Right. Right. We can make the choice, but we can't actually transform our heart in that sense. We have to depend on the power of God. We have to depend on the power of God. What else? I think one of the, yes, sir. One of the essential elements I think of this is that God's intention is to create a modern version. Mm. The, the goal of God is us able to dwell in His presence. Yeah. Eden is currently it runs current scripture idea that God <coughs> right in their bits. <coughs> so law, his law um means by a group of people well present. Right. Jesus comes on the scene issues all that they they believe that part of God's dwelling in the present 
they had great talking. Yeah. Jesus comes on and says, no, it's, it's going to happen because you're going to allow yourself broke to your least common denominator. Mm. Go all the way down to the surface, I mean, the very fabric of DNA, and then that's where the transformation happens. happens. Jesus says, those that hunger and thirst, like two neighbors there, that word also brings forth justice. Mm. So the whole reason for breaking, being broken all the way down to my, to my very core person is so that I can, I can carry forward in my life the justice of God, mm. which that's what Michael brings forth. What does God require? Honest to do just of God. That's right. And so as people of God, many times we miss it because we're trying to modify a version of our faith. And Paul says, find within there is no good thing. There's nothing there that, that modifies, that is modified to be able to accomplish God. I am in complete, complete state broken. Mm -hmm. He goes and gets Israelites out of Egypt. They are broke. They have been oppressed to that they are treated as right. almost subhuman. Right. And God then comes in. Why does he wait until they are broken to that point? Mm -hmm. Goes and rescues and hates the fabric and the frame for him to be able to present. That's what current thing is to our scripture. So I, I think we miss that because we look at ourselves as pretty mm -hmm. We do. But we Paul do. said most of us will probably struggle kind of hey. Paul says, even on my best day, in this in this un this undone situation, undone my best I'm not hmm. and I think we miss that sometimes even with man is that that's why we, I, I, I apologize please do you can take the notes you're so good <laughs> I apologize for being totally like sporadic but Paul says been crucified yeah there's nothing there to modify because it's dead instead yeah yeah we, we should be renewed as as david was saying we should be renewed and that theme like you're saying is throughout the entire bible we failed at the very beginning and the hope is to have a renewal again with god it's a beautiful story of redemption it changes us to our very core changes the very core not just changing and modifying ourselves it's a very good point let's turn to john 3 and we get an idea of a conversation here of things not jiving well together so John, John chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. He, uh, he is a prominent uh, Pharisee. He's well-educated, but it's showing a difficult time, or showing the Jews having a difficult time realizing this transformation and this new covenant. I'm going to have Tyler read that. John 3, verses 1 through 9. 9. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a second enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, 
how can the how can these things be? Perfect. So right off the bat, there we get Nicodemus. He isn't getting it here. Look at verses three and five. If we compare them, verses three and five. They're almost identical. Jesus is saying the same thing. He clarifies in verse 5 with two big differences. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Notice the difference there. Water and Spirit. Think about this for a second. What is being born equivalent to being born again? Easy answer. What is it? Life. That's right. That's right. And we're given this born-again state when we're baptized. You see that water and spirit coming together there. That baptism is hinted at in this lesson, this idea of being born again. Let's turn to Jeremiah 31, because as Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation, this is the text that should be on Nicodemus' mind when he's talking to Jesus. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And real quick, I'm going to have Tyler read that. It was well, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, through, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them, and I'll write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one, uh, sorry, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know of me, from the, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Perfect. That last line there in verse 34, that is a new covenant. That is what Jesus did for us so that we could be in a new covenant with, with God. The new covenant is God's promise that he will forgive us of our sins and our iniquities there and not remembering it, but making us clean and cleaning our souls. And so when Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, be born again, this is what he's referencing. A transformation, not just from an old covenant into a new covenant, but a sinful life, a sinful soul, into a clean, a clean soul. We see that brought about first in baptism. And when God, God will do this in verse 33, he'll put his law, it says, within the hearts of his people. His people do obey God, not just because it's there or it's a rule, but because it is the will of God. You see, we love God and we live to be transformed through him. Our character, our heart, our spirit should show this because it's essential. Thank you, guys. Thank you.